Hi everyone, Sam here, otherwise known as FPL Pricey. In today's video, I'll be taking a look at my team selection ahead of game week 13 and hopefully helping you lock in your team along the way as well. Right then, so before we get started, a quick shout out and a hat trick now for Antonio Montana, who has gotten the guess right on three different videos for which top I'm wearing. Now, if you want to beat him and win the shout out for the next video, just simply guess what shirt I'm wearing right now, what season it's from, and whether it's home, away, or a third kit as well. It's a fairly easy one because the name's kind of on the shirt. But if you can get there first and guess the season and which type of kit, first, second, third, it is, then you could have your own shout out. In the meantime, though, let's take a look at my team from game week 12, which I've talked about a little bit in my transfer plans video earlier on in the week. But a quick review now that we've locked in all 11 players. Obviously, earlier on in the week, it was before the Newcastle match. Sadly, Paul and Isaac both disappointed. Neither of them got anything, although my hopes were raised when Hall played through Isaac and Isaac finished fantastically in the first half. Unfortunately, of course, it was offside. So nothing really to shout about in that game. Very frustrating, of course, having just brought in both of them. But I won't lose hope just yet. And hopefully this weekend against Crystal Palace will get a little bit more out of them. Overall, 68 points with a minus four. So I was on a green arrow despite taking my first hit of the season. And up to 1.2 million now. So I'm starting to make progress. I'm starting to get back to where I want to be. Still not there yet, but overall, definitely small steps in the right direction. Double Arsenal clean sheet. Hopefully we get that again this weekend. And Pedro Porro was undoubtedly the highlight, maybe not just of the weekend, but of the season for me as well. To get a clean sheet, a goal and two bonus away at the Etihad, despite all of Man City's problems, was beyond my wildest dreams. So thank you, Pedro Porro. That's been really, really helpful. And that's the reason I probably got the green arrow as well. Elsewhere, Salah Cap, obviously two goals, took the shirt off, got the yellow card, bit annoying, but 13 points. And that is now eight double digit hauls in 12 game weeks. And he's got 23 bonus points in 12 game weeks as well. He's averaging almost two bonus points a game, which is just absolutely ridiculous. This guy is on fire. Elsewhere, nothing else to shout about in the midfield. Up top, Slanky with the assist for the Pedro Porro goal, which made that moment all the sweeter. But 68 points. It wasn't a big, big performance. It wasn't a big green, but it's baby steps in the right direction. So overall, pretty happy. Now, let me know what score you got in the comment section below and whether or not you beat me this game week. So as always, we need to talk through some of the key issues facing our teams ahead of game week 13. So if you were unaware of these, this is your official warning. Now, first up is Antoine Semenyo, who is red flagged in FPL, so you probably have noticed. He got his fifth yellow card and his suspension for one game week, unfortunately against Wolves, which would have been a pretty nice game for Bournemouth and for Semenyo to have played in. Now, a lot of managers are selling Semenyo, obviously understand why he's got the red flag, but because it's such a specific one game week issue, and I've got him in my team as well, by the way, so this applies to me too, I'm really keen on just holding on to him this week and I'm going to bench him if at all possible. Now, this is a reason I wanted eight strong attackers because if a player is out with an injury or a suspension for one game week, I can just hide them on my bench. I can bring in someone, even if they don't have the best fixture, which again, you'll see in my team in a minute is probably the case. It's probably not worth using an extra transfer to get rid of a player that actually over the long term, I really quite still like. The data's good, 0.5 XGI per 90, and the fixtures over the next patch, even after the Wolves fixture, are really good too. So I want to hold on to Semenyo. If you've only got seven attackers that are playing and Semenyo is one of them, then obviously you've got a decision to make and you probably want to be moving him on. But if you've got a way of hiding him on your bench without negatively impacting your side, I think do so. Okay, so moving on to two defenders on this spreadsheet at the moment, or two centre-backs rather. Gabriel and Canate both came off in the Champions League in midweek with injuries. Now, it looks like Gabriel was some minor discomfort, so hopefully nothing too serious there. I doubt we'll hear anything from Arteta in the press conferences because we never do. But my assumption on Gabriel would be that he was taken off more as a precautionary measure considering the position that Arsenal were in on the night or in the match, five or 
or up at the time i can't quite remember but it was definitely safe to be bringing him off rather than taking the risk Canate, on the other hand, looked a little bit more serious. Again, speculation, but we'll have to wait and see on that. Slot might give us some news in the press conference before the deadline, but I wouldn't bank on it. And considering it's against Man City this weekend and considering what the injury looked like at the, at the time, I think Canate is more doubtful than Gabriel. And if you're relying on him as a starter this week... I would be a little bit concerned, especially because it's Man City as well. So maybe he's a transfer out if you have to start him regardless. If you don't and you were planning on benching him against Man City, then it's less of an issue. Obviously, you can just wait to see whether he's in the starting lineup. Now, Trent Alexander-Arnold, before we come on to Erling Haaland, Trent is another player that's been injured. He was, however, on the bench as an unused substitute against Real Madrid, which suggests to me he's pretty close. He wouldn't be on the bench if they weren't able to play him if they really wanted to for at least some minutes. So I'd imagine that he's back pretty soon. If you've held on to him this long, then I wouldn't be selling him now, considering it was Man City this weekend anyway. You probably weren't that keen on starting him anyway. And then after that, you've got a good run of fixtures anyway. So I think... Trent is probably a hold if you've kept him, but the other two, maybe just keep an eye on. I'd probably hold on to Gabriel. I'm certainly planning on doing so. Now, Erling Haaland, quick one, isn't an injury concern. It's more of a form concern, and a lot of managers are selling him. So I wanted to talk about him now. I sold him last week, and I got lucky. I think every week that people have been selling him for the last few, you've gotten lucky because he's gotten the chances, he's gotten the underlying XG data, he just hasn't been returning. And these things come and go and you might call it form, you might call it eye test, and that's absolutely fair enough. And at the end of the day, I came to the same decision and I was like, enough's enough. But at some point, we, we won't be able to predict the moment in which he'll just start putting every single chance away yet again. And that will come at some point. So don't be fooled into thinking that Erling Haaland is simply just a bad player and he's washed or whatever. I think it's more complex than that. And I think that there will come a moment that we won't be able to necessarily predict that he will start just bagging more chances again. So we saw it in midweek, obviously City collapsed, but he scored twice. One was a penalty. But Overall, we don't quite know just yet when it's going to happen, but the fact that the fixtures over the next five aren't amazing and are not, I wouldn't plan on captaining him necessarily in any of the next five. I think that now is an opportunity if you wanted to take it to get rid of him and spread the funds elsewhere and maybe get some better team uh, balance, I suppose, around your 11. And that's certainly the choice that I made last week. But again, don't be fooled. He's not a bad player by any means. And he will tick along at about a goal a game for the rest of the season over a long run average. So again, you can sell him. Absolutely. I did it. That's fine. But do be warned. He's not just going to tick along with two pointers every single week. That's just not who Erling Haaland is. Right then. So on to the key transfer targets ahead of game week 13. All of the interesting players that I suppose most of us are looking at buying ahead of game week 13. I've talked about a few of these guys already in my who to buy video from earlier on in the week. So if you wanted a more detailed analysis on any of them, then do go and check that out. In the meantime, though, let's take a quick look at the top five right now. Jao Pedro, I would say, is probably top of the list. It certainly is for me. And the reason is price. At the end of the day, the data is very good. The minutes are increasing week on week since the injury. And I'd imagine Friday night ahead of Southampton at home is an ideal time to be jumping on someone that is incredible value for money, under six million, this guy has definitely been underpriced at the start of the season, considering he's on penalties. He's one of the most important players in Brighton's attack. And when fit and when getting 90 minutes, the data is absolutely incredible. So really like Jao Pedro, but he's not the only striker I like. Matthias Cunha as well is just ticking along. Is he still 6.9 or is he 7 now? I forget, but he's still very good value for money considering he's ticking all of the same boxes as Jao Pedro. The data's not quite as good, but he's more secure for the 90 minutes. He doesn't get injured as often either. And he just seems so talismanic to everything Wolves are doing. Both of those two teams, Brighton and Wolves, have incredible fixtures for the next little run. Brighton's go on quite a lot longer though. So that is one thing to maybe keep an eye on. And Jao Pedro for me could be, if he stays fit, a better long, long-term hold 
of course, the price helps too. Now, looking at Bakayo Saka, he is definitely right at the top of my list now. He's the next priority that I want to be bringing in. And at the moment, transfers that I'm making this week and possibly next will all be in the favour of redistributing my funds. And part of why I sold Erling Haaland last week, by the way, was to do this so that I could get to Saka in my midfield on top of Salah and Palmer. So Saka, the data is really good as well. It is more heavily reliant on the... XA data so far this season but with Martin Erdegaard back we've seen already that Saka does get on the end of more chances rather than having to be the chief creator in the side and I think again that just bodes well for Saka he's incredible in the BPS the bonus points so any return he gets is very likely to come with some bonus attached and I think he's great value for money and definitely for some reason I think a lot of managers are unwilling to captain him I'm not the same. I think he is definitely a captainable player. And over the next spread of fixtures, I can see opportunities to put the armband on him as well. So I really like the look of him over the next, probably, arguably, all the way through to March, considering Arsenal's fixtures. Now, the two Spurs boys, a quick mention, Porro and Madison. I wouldn't get too carried away on either of them. I own Porro. I'm very happy as an owner, but I wouldn't be ripping up my team to bring him in. They can be very frustrating at times and clean sheets are few and far between. Obviously incredible they kept one against Man City, but with both of their centre-backs doubts at the moment and Vicario now out for months, not weeks, months, Forster will be in goal. Their defence will be weakened somewhat and I think clean sheets are going to be fairly rare. They're not a bad defence. They've improved defensively in terms of the data this season, but they will concede the odd goal. So Porro is more of a, an attacking upside play. And I think if I had the choice whether or not to buy him right now, I'd probably just swerve, to be very honest. But I've got him and I will hold him until I need the money elsewhere. So I think for now he's okay. But I, a lot of the transfer activity this week is because of the 14-pointer. I wouldn't let that cloud your judgment too much. Madison is very similar, by the by the way, as well. He might have more of a secure starting role, c considering injuries around the eleven for Spurs right now. But we know the minutes will be managed because it has been so far this season, and he does run hot or cold for considerable points in the season. And I think that if you can get on him at the right time. He can be an incredible asset because he's already gotten, I think, nine attacking returns this season. He is explosive and he is very important to everything Spurs do when he's in form. But that form comes and goes quite quickly. It's unpredictable. And like a few of, uh, a few of the other hot transfer targets we've discussed earlier on this season, he could easily find himself out of the side in another two or three game weeks. And because of all of the other high quality midfielders, around his price and sometimes cheaper and I just think that maybe he's not a player that I'd be hanging all my hopes on right now for the foreseeable especially over the Christmas period where fixtures are coming thick and fast I think rotation will come for James Madison at times so overall these are my top five let me know if I've missed any of your key transfer targets ahead of the weekend and I'll try and get through them in the comments below so let's take a quick look at the match projections by Rob T FPL do go check him out on Blue Sky or on Twitter at Rob T FPL. Incredible work as always from him. And these are the projected goals and clean sheet odds ahead of the weekend. Now, the top one right now, the standout fixture is Brighton at home to Southampton. 2.45 goals expected for Brighton. So that really does go to show why so many managers are keen on bringing in Jao Pedro and the like because we're expecting goals in that fixture, considering the way that Southampton played against Liverpool. Whilst it was a good performance overall, I would argue, there are mistakes at the back with McCarthy in goal right now, Ramsdale out for a while, and Bednarek also out. Southampton are going to concede goals. So Brighton at home at the Amex on the Friday night under the lights. I do foresee some goals in that game. And who knows where they'll come from, by the way, because Brighton do spread their goals around. But having maybe a little wedge of action in that match would be good for your team. Elsewhere, some highlights. Chelsea expected over two goals against Aston Villa, so a potential captaincy option there for Cole Palmer, or perhaps Nick Nicholas Jackson as well is a good option too. Now, Tottenham, as always, it seems at the moment, over-expected goals of two, which is, again, very, very promising. At home to Fulham, I probably wouldn't be selling Solanke or maybe not even Brennan Johnson, who was benched last weekend, but you'd expect that that was tactical, scored off the bench anyway, so not really too bothered there. 
And elsewhere, Brentford expected over two goals against Leicester. Mbermo's not been in the greatest of form recently, but this could be an opportunity for him. Arsenal, Man United are the other two expected over two. Elsewhere, the highlights I would say are in the clean sheet odds. Not many sides are expected clean sheets this weekend, so maybe not worth manoeuvring or taking hits to bringing defenders. But Arsenal are top of the bill with a 42% chance away at West Ham. West Ham were good against Newcastle, by the way, so it's not going to be an easy fixture. But seeing this percentage does make me more confident in my double Arsenal clean sheet. And hopefully... If you're bringing in an Arsenal player, then you have a pretty decent chance of securing a clean sheet as well. Elsewhere, Nottingham Forest, Man United and Brighton are the three other highlights for a potential clean sheet. So if you were looking at defensive transfers, all of those would be a good bet this weekend. So on to the captaincy matrix ahead of game week 13. And this week will be a really interesting one because Erling Haaland's not made it into the top five for me, I think for the first time this season. Now, obviously, he is always going to be a decent bet. There's never going to be a game week where he's not expected to do something but I think all of these five players probably are standout options ahead of him this game week. Starting from the bottom with the differentials, Umbermo and Pedro, I think, are interesting options. Umbermo, I would say, whilst I'm happy to have him this week, I probably wouldn't be captaining him based on the fact that he has been playing quite a lot wider recently, especially with Wissa through the middle. And against the weaker sides, they do play with that front three where Umbermo does sit quite wide as a right winger. And with that in mind, the data also goes to show that he's not been getting the shots away at all recently. I think it's actually only one shot on goal in the last three game weeks. In two of those three game weeks, he's managed zero XG. So we're not expecting big things from him in terms of shot volume. But it is against weak opposition who at the moment are managerless at time of recording anyway. And I would expect goals to fly in for Brentford. It's just whether or not they come from Mbermo or maybe someone like a Wisser instead. But regardless, I am happy to hold him. It's just not necessarily someone I'd be comfortable captaining ahead of the other options, considering that very, very low shot volume in the last few weeks. Pedro is very interesting. I'd just be a little bit concerned on expected minutes. He's got all of the other boxes ticked and a great fixture, but he might get taken off a bit early if they're winning the game comfortably, especially again with three fixtures in the space of seven days for Brighton, or eight days, I suppose, because they're playing on the Friday for Brighton over the next week. You can see an important player like Pedro being brought off if they're comfortable in the game. Now on to the three main ones. These are the three that I'd definitely be targeting for captaincy ahead of game week 13. Starting with Palmer, Aston Villa at home is not a bad fixture whatsoever. It's especially away from home. Aston Villa's XGC per 90 is up at around 1.7 a game, which isn't great. And considering they'll be a little bit tired from midweek, they put out a very strong side against Juventus. Chelsea obviously rotate a lot more in Europe and Palmer won't be playing in Europe in midweek either because he's not even registered for the competition. A fresh Palmer against perhaps a leggy Aston Villa. I see it as a potential explosive fixture for him. And I do imagine he'll get good pockets of space in front of the two centre-backs this weekend. So fingers crossed Palmer is a very good option. Saka away at West Ham, another very good option. The data isn't quite as good as Salah or Palmer, but like I mentioned, he's a monster on bonus points. And I think that data is perhaps a touch under where we'd expect it to be if Erdegaard had been fit the last few game weeks. With him back in, I expect this data to improve and I do really like him as a captaincy option this weekend. But neither of those two, for me anyway, beat Salah at home to Man City. Yes, it's the trickiest fixture on paper, out of all of these options and perhaps one of the trickiest on paper in the entire season. But Man City at the moment on the break are so, so easy to play through compared, I suppose, to what they used to be. Again, it's all it's all weighted, but it is much easier to play through them than it has been in the past without Rodri and with Kovacic as well. I think it's much easier to get at them on the break. And Liverpool are, if not the very best counter-attacking team in the world right now, certainly up there in, in the conversation. And Salah is almost always that kind of counter-punch threat 
where every single time Man City will squeeze up the pitch. And we saw it even against Southampton. We saw it against Aston Villa, uh, Aston Villa earlier in the season. Salah will kind of wait, ready to pounce on the counter and press quickly when they are exposed. So I think that Man City are going to give up at least two or three of those opportunities to Liverpool. Salah is almost always at the end of those. And considering the form he's in right now, the data's great. I think that Salah has a great chance of hauling against Man City. I really, really like the matchup. And honestly, the second that the deadline switched over and I got to set my bus team ahead of game week 13, I put it on Salah and I said to myself, there is absolutely no chance, barring injury, of course, that I'm moving it anywhere else. I'm so certain that I want it on Salah this game week. And obviously he might not get the most points this week, but I think in terms of who I'm most confident on, no question about it, it's Mohamed Salah at home to Man City this weekend. Right, so a quick update on my transfers. I did mention this earlier on in my transfer plans video this week, but if you haven't got the chance to go and watch that, this basically, in a nutshell, is the short version of that video. It is finally over. Dominic Calvert-Lewin, who has been the worst transfer in or wildcard pick in FPL history possibly for me, has finally been sold. I brought in Jao Pedro. I didn't even wait until the end of the game week. I brought him in on Saturday evening after the fixtures had been played that day because there was no way I was going through another week of owning Calvert-Lewin ahead of someone like Pedro. It could have been Wissa or even Jimenez or any, basically anyone, and I would have preferred them over Calvert-Lewin. However, as it is, Jao Pedro was rising in price and I um, I imagined he would have risen in price a couple more times this week considering the form he's in and the fixture he had. So I just wanted that transfer out of the way and done just so I could look at my team without Calvert-Lewin in it and I was much more confident in my team performance going into game week 13 having made the transfer early. Yes, it's a risk and players can pick up injuries in midweek. But I decided to myself, even if this transfer in particular ended up having to be for a hit, I wanted to do it regardless. I think it pays off 99 times out of 100. So even if there are injuries elsewhere in my side, I still wanted to make this move. So that is done. And finally, I've got Jao Pedro ahead of Calvert-Lewin in my side. Right then, so let's take a look at my actual team selection ahead of game week 13. No free transfers at the moment because, as I mentioned, I've already made my move very early this game week. Jao Pedro now does sit there and it is lucky that I've got him because Semenyo now has to move to the bench, obviously being suspended away against Wolves. So I do still have a playing seven in attack, one of which is Rodgers away at Chelsea, which perhaps is the player I would have liked to bench ideally. But because Semenyo's out, I think it's okay to play Rodgers and I don't think it's worth taking a hit to sell Semenyo or Rodgers, of course, to bring in another player with a better fixture this week. Because one, if I sold Semenyo, it's removing a player who I believe is good value and has good fixtures over the next run. So I want to hold on to him and I don't think any player that I could buy right now would be worth the money. And Rodgers, again... It's a very similar situation. Whilst I'm not I'm not enamoured with the fixture this weekend, overall Villa's fixtures are pretty good. And I don't think I'm going to be able to find another player who provides the same sort of value in his position. Now, I could upgrade either of those players with the 2.6 million I've got in the bank and maybe get a lot more out of a player who's 7.5 to 8 million. But crucially, I don't want to do that because next week I'm looking at bringing in Bakayo Saka and I do want to have that money in the bank so I can make that switch more painlessly. And again, it's all about balance. It's all about structure. And I don't want to be piling that extra money into another midfielder when again, I think it's just got to go on Saka in the next couple of game weeks. Elsewhere around my side, I've still got double Arsenal defence, so Raya and Gabriel. Fingers crossed on Gabriel, I will be starting him. I doubt we'll hear anything from Arteta. If he misses the game, then I can play either Greaves or Lewis. I need to sort out my bench order. I would probably put Greaves ahead of Lewis at this point, because I just don't see any universe where Liverpool don't score against Man City. But then again, Lewis does at least have some more attacking upside. So that might be a bit of a decision I need to make over the coming days. Hopefully, though, Gabriel does play and that's not even something I need to worry about. Paul and Poro make up my defence. 
Horro, obviously, at home to Fulham, I think is a very good fixture. Crystal Palace away for Hall also isn't bad at all. I was very impressed with him on the pitch in terms of eye test against West Ham. Obviously, it didn't go his way, but he was very involved in their attacking build-up. There were a couple of chances he created, so I think he's great value for money at under 4.5 million. In midfield, very happy, as I mentioned, with three of them. Palmer, Salah and Mbermo, all captaincy options. The armband is on Salah and it won't be moving. A vice captain is Palmer. I think he is probably the second best option considering the very low shot volume from Mbermo recently. But I do really like that Aston Villa fixture for Palmer. So if you wanted to go with Palmer as a captain, again, I would have no problem with that or no argument with that whatsoever. Up top, I do like my forward line right now. Solanke and Pedro both at home against Fulham and Southampton respectively. Definitely chances for points there. And Isaac, despite being frustrating against West Ham, obviously the goal that was offside gave me a little bit of a glimmer of hope. But he has been on good form recently. It is a good fixture. And Newcastle's fixtures over the long run, with the Liverpool fixture to one side next game week, are actually looking really decent. So I do want to hold on to him, if at all possible. Overall, pretty happy with my 11. I think there's a decent chance for a green arrow, especially if I don't take a hit. And fingers crossed, I don't need to. Let me know how your team is shaping up ahead of the deadline in the comments below. And if you've got any dilemmas ahead of locking in your side, do let me know and I'll try and answer all of you before the deadline. In the meantime, if you could leave a like and subscribe to the channel, it really would be greatly, greatly appreciated. For now, though, good luck in game week 13 and I'll see you on the other side ahead of a very quick deadline in game week 14. So come back quickly to this channel and I'll walk you through all of the key updates ahead of the Tuesday deadline.